Hello, everyone. Welcome. I see you're filing in. Welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 686 New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Tunji Adani Jones and Yasi Alipur. And we are thrilled to welcome poet Imani Elizabeth Jackson here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that, sus that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, the paintings of Tunji Adani Jones emerge from a perspective of what the artist describes as cultural addition, combination, and collaboration. Born and educated in the UK and now living and working in the USA, his practice is inspired by the ancient history of West Africa and its attendant mythology and by his Yoruba heritage. Addressing the perception of the black body within Western painting, and in particular, its association with physicality, Adeni Jones uses the body as both narrative instrument and primary tool of communication. Iranian artist, writer, and folder Yasi Alipur currently lives in Brooklyn and wonders about paper, counting, and silence. She received her MS MFA from Columbia University and is a faculty member at Columbia, Parsons, and SBA New York. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'll turn it over to you, Yasi. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Carolyn, thank you for that beautiful intro. Tunji, it's so good to see you here. Um, you mentioned this uh, in our initial meeting, uh, in our initial email exchange, uh, that it feels uh, in in relation to your work, it makes sense that you have been traveling. So we find you in Venice today and yeah. uh, in your new hotel room. Uh, yeah. Thank you for being here. Uh, we really appreciate the time you're putting uh, to talk to us. Uh, Tunji's incredible work is currently being exhibited at Nikhil Bushin Gallery. Cannot recommend uh, more that anyone goes and see it in person. I'm really excited about our conversation. Um, but I must say the photos don't do it justice. I hope everyone gets a chance to look at the texture, to stay uh, with the bodies and the dances of your work. Tunji, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And yeah, I thought in light of how relevant my movements and travels have been to everything that I do, that it would make quite a lot of sense for me to managed to have this conversation right as soon as I arrived with a few hours delayed on on the flight and everything but you know I started my day actually in Lagos about 20 hours ago so I, I got to London I had been in Lagos for five days I got to London waited six hours then got my flight to Venice from London there was a delay so that's why there was a rush but yeah that kind of um confluence of things and experiences that I will have kind of physically and culturally all at once and kind of my sense of ownership um, to some, and then my sense of, um, yeah, absolutely alienness to others, like me being here in Venice, I've never been to Venice before. Um, so, but, you know, I started in Lagos, and that's a place that I know is my own, and I know that I'm of that culture, but I'm also um, coming back to it now at a different point in my life with a different intentionality and a different sense of understanding and purpose. So all of this happening at once is also exactly what fuels the work in the paintings, right? So I think when people like to ask me what inspires what I do and what I'm thinking about and or maybe just why, you know, why I do what I do. It seems that these cycles that I'm going through and in particular, what I've just been through today is a key example of what I would then want to sit down, process, make some drawings about, make some paintings about, just moving through these different spaces, different colors, different textures, smells, energies, feelings, people, um, things like that. Amazing. Uh, can we, uh, if it's okay with you, I think it would be great to uh, look at some of the images 
of the current show and have our conversation. Um, Dunji, it's really interesting for me, uh, looking at your work, I was thinking a lot about the depth and all the meanings that can come mm -hmm. with words like diaspora. Um, mm -hmm. The introduction today was also so beautiful. I felt like 60% of the questions I wanted to ask was in the introduction that Carolyn uh, read mm -hmm. to us. Um, but what a journey it's like to think about yeah. Lagos, London, yeah. Venice. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we will talk about this more. I know Simone Lee has been important for you to think about. Yes. So it makes yeah. sense. To be I'm so excited invented. to see that work. Yeah, yeah. So excited yeah. to see that and, work. Yeah. And we're the Brooklyn Rail. So I guess we have Brooklyn in the room too. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> yeah, everyone is yeah. present. Um, something yeah. I wanted to ask, and you already mentioned this. Um, kind of these many facets of your lived experience and both like mm -hmm. politically, socially, historically, culturally, mm -hmm. uh, it's like kind of what informs your work. A word you use for me that has a lot of potential and significance is to think about what is additive, um, mm -hmm. relationship to the body and the way you think about painting mm -hmm. and then like identity or how the body becomes politicized. Uh, mm -hmm. I noticed that that word was also in your intro now. I'm I thought maybe that's a good way for us to begin. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, additive, additive in the sense that I feel when I'm in Lagos, Nigeria, as I've left there just now, I do feel like I've both received and, and contributed certain things. I do feel like the conversations that I had with people, there was an art fair that happened, um, Art X Lagos. So I met a lot of artists, which is really exciting. and local artists, somewhat international, but there was a great exchange that was happening, right? And um, I think even on a sort of commerce level in the way that the, the fair is selling quite a lot, like it's kind of a freeze or anything like that, even on that level, there were things that I was contributing to and receiving. And I think that um, when I'm making an image or when I'm painting or making a drawing, I do want these figures to feel like um, they can do the same. So I'd want the viewer to maybe feel like they can learn from but not maybe feel too alienated by at the same time I think when I first started making these these characters it was quite specific to what I wanted to describe as a Yoruba character that was from that background and I understood that that was a language that rang pretty true and clear to those who knew it and those who were of it but I wanted to open that up a little bit and make bodies that were equally compelling to those who didn't perhaps know as much about the specifics of those nuances um, and indeed, when I go to Lagos now, I'm thinking about more than just the Yoruba, right? I'm thinking about the other tribes as well. I'm thinking about the kind of combination of everything meeting at once. Um, so it's kind of this show in particular is just, uh, yeah, a first, a first step in me trying to add textures and layers without removing because, yeah, the characters end up being quite muted in terms of, you know, there's no hair, the features are kind of pared down. So there's this kind of reduction of feature, but I do want to add as much kind of cultural complexity as possible and make them as um, versatile as possible, whilst also making them not need to be as specifically he, she, they, for example, mm -hmm. but just kind of like a combination mm -hmm. of, of things. He say, um, yeah, it's also interesting. Sometimes I, I wonder, um, I'm, I'm thinking about the movement of the bodies in your painting, mm -hmm. especially, I think the current show feels very special because it has your printmaking as well. Yes. And the way uh, the this body of work, there's a lot about how there's a sense of floating, dancing, falling, emerging, or mm -hmm. even that word feels important. Um, but to step back, for me, it's been really interesting in thinking about what it means to be um, you you talk about this often about what it meant as a British Nigerian artist to move to new, to the states mm -hmm. uh, to study at Yale and to then think about uh, kind of the history that is around here. Something mm -hmm. I found very beautiful is like in our email exchanges, I asked you for resources and the interviews were you recommended to me, and then you focus a lot about on your elders, like other artists that make your work possible. And for me, it was interesting to think there's like Nigerian modernists, um, mm -hmm. both the mm -hmm. ones you've met and the ones you've written about. 
Mm -hmm. uh, there's the influence of Harlem Renaissance um, mm -hmm. to someone like when, and then to think about uh, European influences from Black British artists to the mm -hmm. Negritude movement. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought it was really interesting that what you recommended for me to think about was to bring mm -hmm. this history in depth to your work. And sometimes mm -hmm. you talk about this how in your paintings, like you're a student of painting. And mm -hmm. I was thinking as someone mm -hmm. went to Oxford, like I feel like you've done the work of writing the academic papers. Exactly. To kind of find language, to like be in that logic. Mm -hmm. um, and it, for me, it's really interesting what it means to be the student and have these influences in your painting to think about these characters, like these figures, these historical figures in your work. Um, it's kind of a rambling thought, but I wanted to bring them into our room today. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up, especially the point about me being a student, because, yeah, that that's that's a really big part of this and this process and, and these paintings. And I feel like I'm learning and growing with every body of work. And um, the printmaking is a key element to that, too. That's a great moment of kind of, you know, printmaking forces you to slow down and it forces you to collaborate and it forces you to humble yourself to both uh, a medium which is unpredictable and well it's predictable but also quite unpredictable in the same merit and also you are forced to collaborate with you know master printmakers so you have you have to kind of deal with your artistic ego in a way that's really really generative when you're thinking about learning and growing and developing a technique because you know you'll get frustrated but then when you learn something and figure something out it will be a complete sort of uh, it will be the first time that that's happened. And those moments are hard to engineer when you're not in a school setting, right? When you're not writing a paper or sitting in the library for hours, it's actually quite hard to engineer that in the studio, a kind of organic learning. Mm -hmm. So printmaking has been a fantastic resource for that with me. And how that's kind of fit into these works is uh, the sort of layering and building up of textures. So this image that's in front of us right now, there's areas that have gesso, there's areas that have clear gesso, there's areas that have kind of, uh, a clear kind of matte medium on it so it all rests flat the picture plane is flat but the paint is all sitting on different layers and, and different levels and that's something that I just learned from printmaking because you have to sort of think of a flat image in these different matrices and platforms and you know being forced to slow down and consider the whole image in its entirety in just one color before thinking about it in another then allowed me to come to these large paintings and think about things in the lot in the same way and think about large swaths of areas that would just be kind of blocked out and then I can work over those but it's like a screen you know it's also also very similar to screen printing right just just coming up with different screens but for me um for some reason that's just been a really useful way to think about pushing the depth and the texture of my work um in a way that kind of has opened up this whole new space both chromatically and compositionally because I now feel like I can play with colors in a way that I was a bit anxious and scared to before yeah. and um when you allow for different textures colors can react and interact with each other differently so you can be a lot more playful and um that's what's been happening with these these two um yeah you know someone who uh, who's not a painter it's always kind of hard for me to find that kind of verbiage but i think it really mm -hmm. comes through with the work um in the room, both the pairings of the different nearly monochromatic paintings, but also mm -hmm. like, I think that's what I meant where it's like, I don't think the photographs can do it justice. Like, what is mm -hmm. that, what it feels like to be in the room? Cause mm -hmm. I do think there's a sense of lightness, weight mm -hmm. and that additive sense that comes through. Mm -hmm. So it's kind mm -hmm. of wonderful to hear about your process too. Um, for me, it's also interesting to think about uh, what it means to show uh, the printmaking or spaces that are closer to drawing and your lines. Yes. Um, yeah. And it seems like uh, some of that, like showing them kind of changed um, during COVID too, maybe perhaps because of all the travels, also kind of the elevating of the, I don't know, it's been interesting to see the shift of scale and for me, the playfulness of yes. Both the playfulness, but also, as you said, kind of the, its own structures or its own rules. Uh, I've yes. also been interested in how yes. you kind of talk about improvisation in your work or finding yes. ways to explore that. Yeah, Can you tell me. That's. I, th <laughs> I think. I think. Yeah. No. I. I really. Um. 
I'm aligning with what you're saying. I'm, I'm seeing where you're going with it. And, and it's, it's exciting because you're picking up on the things that um, have been really exciting about making this work and about showing the prints alongside the paintings and the scale shift is a really important thing. Um, you know, to speak of Simone Lee, it's like to, to create a compelling figure that's, you know, handheld and then one that's the size of a building, but for it to retain the same potency is, is a really um, impressive and difficult skill to do. Um, so you really kind of have to understand how you want the figure to be represented, how you want color to function and things like this. So yeah, printmaking has really helped with that because when you start on such a micro scale, it becomes, you, you become to you become able to intuitively understand it on a mag sort of like you know macro scale um and and the body gets engaged in a different way and that kind of takes picks up on the rest you know because yeah with some of these paintings they're quite large so when you're standing in front of them it's also just the kind of physical relation of being in front of kind of in their monochromatic space and so that play with abstraction is also something that i find really um exciting as well um, and the periphery, so the way in which colors kind of will sit in your peripheral vision when you're looking at one in front of you and how the ones to your left and your right will also um, oh. vibrate in your vision. Um, mm. And that's, oh. yeah, I mean, that that is something that has is able to happen with these prints too in the front. I just, yeah, I just think I learned so much making these lithographs and um, it, it kind of was a one-to-one -one direct translation into the painting. Um, the slowness, the yeah the patience the process yeah time um painting can be especially more recently for everyone i know who's also a painter it's like it can be made quite quickly in a way that can sometimes feel a bit unnatural and forced so any kind of opportunity to slow things down and and to bring things into a more kind of steady pace is was like greatly welcomed by me um yeah I really yeah. love how you use the word periphery because yeah I was looking at the kind of different documentations something that is hard to describe in the images is how um what happens with the mirroring between the different paintings there's like palettes mm -hmm. very specific way of like sensing your body as the viewer too yes. um one thing I wanted to ask which has been very key in your work in this time especially even in the press release you're kind of very vocal about it and it's to think about flatness and especially silhouettes mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. thinking about the history of visual artists that make your work possible who think mm -hmm. about what is the silhouette uh what is mm -hmm. kind of the radical political possibilities of thinking about um silhouettes so mm -hmm. I wanted to take some moments and talk about um what that term means for you and how it comes through in your paintings so I was exposed to this first when I moved here actually I had a professor at grad school who introduced me to Aaron Douglas's work and um there are a few others Richard Bruce Nugent and then I kind of it, it blew my mind because the figurative painting where I was coming from in the UK typically had to be so well rendered and so defined and the idea of something being flat would almost render it obsolete so to kind of see these kind of powerful striking silhouettes that had these kind of leaf shapes these leaf shape motifs that are in my work you know that was something that I lifted almost directly from Aaron Douglas this kind of like leafy curvy um frond and and yeah those floral patterns and the flatness of them but then the way that they can become textural and they can start to become textile and then we can look at sort of West African batik and things like this and it can spread across and those connections can be made um yeah, encountering that work was really pivotal for me um, in understanding and deciding how I wanted to present the body because like we were saying with stripping down and subtraction, addition by subtraction and vice versa, it just feels like there's immense power in the, the silhouette and particularly the black body as silhouette in the way that it's been used. You know, uh, music, music covers, book covers and literature and film and all these other different kinds of ways. It just feels that it, um, so striking. And then when I think across to the West African art history that I've been looking more deeply into, like Nigerian modernists, it occurs in the same space. But, you know, I'm still trying to figure out how much collaboration there was in those moments, because the Harlem Renaissance happened a bit sooner than the artists who I'm looking at maybe were making their work. And I'm trying to figure out whether there was any kind of cross-pollination there, whether there was any um, one looking at the other and 
and seeing and then wanting to represent or something like that because you certainly see artists from Nigeria and um, Senegal too and Ghana making flat imagery in the same way that Aaron Douglas would have been making kind of flat imagery too, right so those connections have been really interesting to me over the past few years because they just seem so clear and obvious um, and then you know I'll read a book or I'll, I'll read a James Baldwin essay and it will be him sort of encountering West African theorists and the academics and sort of his experience of that different kind of um, meeting of the same but incredibly different mind and consciousness but how presentation comes into play with this and how language comes into play visual language or written language um, but anyway yeah the silhouette and, and flat figurative representation for, for the black bodies that I wanted to pick just seemed to be the language that I wanted to align myself with it felt like something I could add to and learn from in equal measure um, yeah yeah you blew my mind. Sorry. It's like, I feel like when uh, interviews are really, um, for me, they're really happening. It's like, there's my questions mm -hmm. and then there's like every, there's yeah. all these different connections uh, to think about. Yeah. Uh, I was also thinking at some point in one of your interviews, you kind of like talked about your, um, the education you received out like uh, in London about drawing mm -hmm. kind of like mm -hmm. the perfect anatomy and like learning the muscles kind of like I don't know, like, mm -hmm. I feel like there's something that is very colonial and white about, like, claiming the yeah, interior oh, yeah. of the body yeah, in that yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, like, then it's really yeah, moving yeah. to think about, like, emphasizing, yeah. and, like, this world that is flatness. Um, it's also interesting yeah. for me, because you've been so active in creating these intergenerational conversations, whether mm -hmm. it is, like, the influence of someone like Aaron Douglas, like, literally in your painting, or it's, like, writing something on and one world or different people that mm -hmm. influence you um mm -hmm. but you kind of for me it was really interesting that you were kind of saying that you're trying to understand what the cross-pollinations were and i this is something i think about a lot uh with history that there's a lot of the questions that we still ask with the exception that now we move much faster so it's like these movements between yeah. like the nigeria and like there's like kind of the speed of it anyway i'm going to step yeah. back uh, so something I was thinking about, and it's related, um, with that, I was thinking about in, in an interview, you kind of talked about that exhibition that happened in New York at the Whitney, the grief and grievance exhibition. And yeah. You talked about yeah. That. Uh, and you talked about these three artists and I thought it yeah. was such a beautiful way of thinking about your relationship with painting or the depth in which you think about painting. Uh, mm -hmm. so you talked about the room where there's Carrie James Marshall paintings. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about how he asks a lot of the questions that are also deep in your work. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you talked about the Simone Lee uh, sculptures. And as you mentioned, kind of that sense of scale, but also to mm -hmm. think about the curve, curve of the body. And I think in mm -hmm. that interview you kind of talked about it as the sense of a body that has weight and can yes. bear weight. Yeah, 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 and yeah, strength, then, uh, yeah. And then you talked about Okwui Okpokwasili, who's an incredible uh, choreographer. Mm -hmm. And you kind of, in talking about her work, you said bodies have, our bodies have history, have trauma, have memory. And I feel mm -hmm. like that is so, like thinking about the three of them is, was a beautiful way of thinking about your practice for me, uh, the relationship to how the black body is explored in painting, uh, your relationship with thinking about sculpture and different histories of sculptures and bodies, and then the importance of dance in your work. Uh, anyway, I was mm -hmm. I, I wanted to hear your thoughts in relationship to that. Yeah, it was a really, thank you for bringing that up. It was a really inspiring room. I mean, that show is fantastic, but something about that room really helped me locate myself because yeah, as a non-American black artist in America, it's sometimes hard to know exactly where to inject myself into certain tellings of things like this. But that's this room just seemed really clear because in the Kerry James paintings, you had his renderings of a classical like African sculpture, an object, right? A figurine in the background. So I'm like, okay, I understand that's my way into the painting. And then the figurine is represented in Simone's immense kind of sculpture that's taking up just the right amount of space that means that people can be invited to come up close, but equally is holding the whole room at the same time without being overly invasive or anything. It was such a graceful 
graceful mm -hmm. sculpture. I love that piece. And then Oku's performance kind of giving all of what I'm describing, this life, this movement, um, this kind of this masquerade character that comes to life and starts vibrating and moving and really animating in a way that I'm feeling when I'm looking at the paintings and the sculptures, it's kind of giving it that third dimension. And it just felt like such a stroke of genius curatorially. Um, and then it felt really inspiring for me and it uh, really sort of affirming for ideas that I've been having um, on where exactly I see my place and what I'm able to add and contribute to, where I'm able to, yeah, learn from the history of um, the Black American experience whilst also offering my own kind of contribution. Um, and then sort of seeing what that means, again, thinking about the Harlem Renaissance artists and then the West African artists, like thinking about what these conversations like mean and, and result in, because there's just so much crossover that um, it seems like inevitable that, that there, there are things to be gained from these, these kinds of combinations. And obviously that's, um, what the late curator was thinking about, Okun Wesel, but um, yeah, it's those ideas are, are particularly inspiring, and and yeah, I mean, I can't wait to see Simone's sculpture here. It just seems very, it seemed like a very um, perfect moment that room, and so when I think about my work, I would eventually like to transition into some sort of three dimensional space. Um, that kind of experience is exactly how I would want to think about it, right? Um, whether that be through performance, musical elements, um, all of the above, or video or sculpture or something, I'm thinking about it in those terms of communicating between sort of the two-dimensional, the three-dimensional, the performative, the interactive, the physically engaging. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to then, yeah, to think about what you said about the peripheral in, in this show and like, the movement, like as the viewer, there is something about the dialogue, especially with the scale of the paintings mm -hmm. uh, and the way um, it's interesting. It's like I, I, you walk into the room and it's kind of a painterly show. So it's like it kind of started with the individual canvases. And then the more I stayed with it, there was yeah. more wondering about where I stand with everything. It's interesting. I think yeah. uh, for me, it's funny because now it's in my weird bio. Uh, but I am someone who counts a lot. And I thought it was interesting with the bodies um, in your work. I was yes. like, how many bodies do I find, especially in this yeah. body of work? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it was interesting because I noticed it much later that some of the titles of your pieces play with that. And so far, I think I've mentioned a lot of triples, you know, especially yes. thinking about Lagos, London, and then New York. Yeah. Uh, yeah but then yeah. you have like, Kind of the quarter, uh, like the quartet mm -hmm. body, uh, the quartet, yeah. As, one of, yeah, uh, as one of the paintings here, it's my way of saying another thing that has seemed to be important in your work is the residency you did in Senegal, uh, the Black Mountain, um, and it's been interesting. Look at this body, looking at this body of work. I just remembered an interview I did uh, with Kambui Olujimi, who I believe yeah. was in the same uh, yeah, program. Yeah, yeah. And in yeah. his work at that time, I remember he was talking a lot about thinking about gravity and what it means to have a sense of floating uh, or mm. falling. And are we like, mm. um, are they being emerged uh, by this body of mm. water, in the sky? Mm. And for me, mm. it was really interesting to find that, especially in your paintings this time, mm. uh, to wonder mm. uh, where these bodies are, but also to think about the comfort of the bodies. Uh, and I'm interested in the way you talk about your experience in Senegal and how it was important for you. Um, so yeah, I wanted to hear more of your uh, thoughts about how that residency affected your work and everything that came with it. Yeah, I think uh, that was the first time after that. It was two months I spent there and it completely changed, um, changed my life, changed my practice in the way that it helped me multiply what I was doing. So I, I often would have a solitary figure holding the space and then suddenly I was able to think about two, it started with a lot of duets, but then like, you know, two, three, in this instance, four, I was able to think about multiples because there was so much that was happening in Dakar where we were staying that was both, you know, I felt uh, I felt both at home there and also like, you know, I'm not Senegalese, I'm Nigerian. So it was this weird moment where I had this, um, I became more, it became more clear who and what I was by spending more time there. And then I was learning at, at the very same time, I was learning more about a neighbor, you know, um, a part of the country that I'd never been to. So it was just a very, 
enriching experience and then it helped me think about how I could present an image of that you know how I could present multiple figures that could be the same could not be the same could be vastly diverse in every aspect whilst also being kind of like from the same race or otherwise and it, it kind of helped me pull myself out of just my own solitary uh, Nigerian British living in America experience and think about like how I can start multiplying that and um telling different sides of that and so one thing I like about say even perhaps this image is that it also isn't clear this could also just be one figure moving through a space in a kind of routine at the same time so there's an element of you know maybe there are telltale signs in the form of an ear or belly button or something but there'll never be something that's clear on whether the yet this is four separate figures or one figure kind of moving and I like that aspect to it as well um Kambui and the other artists I met at BlackRock were really fantastic because we, we were all just thinking about the same thing, right? But we hadn't met each other yet in such close proximity. We hadn't got the chance to collaborate. So it was just really cool to see so many different sides of the same idea and so many, um, yeah, so many new expressions of, of the same idea. We're all thinking about our experience in the same way. They have this idea of floating and weightlessness or this idea of being incredibly grounded, um, but not sure where one can be grounded. Um, yeah, it was a fantastic experience. I've been back once since, and that was earlier this year. And then going to Lagos just now has kind of bolstered that whole experience as well. Um, there's a residency in Lagos that I'm going to try and do next year. And so we'll see, we'll see whether that takes all of this next, because this is, um, yeah, really just kind of the beginning of a lot of things. It keeps being, keeps kind of re refreshing in my mind of, of kind of where things can go um, when I open up the space and find out there are all these new things to learn and there are all these new experiences to kind of have an exchange. Yeah. Um, there's a definitely a Middle Eastern auntie in me who just knocked on wood because uh, yeah, I feel yeah. like there's so much you're doing and it's like just yeah. to be witness um, to kind of the depth of the questions uh, you bring yeah. up. Um, so it's then I was thinking, and it's kind of related, but perhaps it goes much deeper and it's like has been very present in um, kind of has been a continuous uh, question in your work. Uh, mm -hmm. But you often talk about language or specifically thinking about the many languages of Nigeria and then how um, you usually say dance, food, and perhaps textile as what is shared among the people, how people can communicate on a daily basis. And music, basis. and music, music, food, and yeah, music is, is a big one too, I'd say, like sound. Yeah. And yeah. I thought, and it's been really interesting to kind of find that as the core of what influences your work in the West African um, history in your work. Uh, mm. But I was also thinking about the way you think about painting and the importance of painting for you. Um, mm. There's an interview you were doing. I'm trying to, this is what I'm looking at my note because it's important to remember the um, names. Um, I'm trying to figure out which interview it was. Um, I think, no, it wasn't. Um, oh, I think it's the interview interview with Alayo Akin Kokbe, uh, yeah. where you talked about um, thinking about what it means to explore history, to explore painting and how perhaps that is mm -hmm. not uh, like a historically, like that there's something deeply Western about the way we think about painting. And you specifically yeah. talked about how that is oil on canvas, not yes. painting in general, yeah. but what does yeah, it yeah. mean to think about yeah. oil on canvas? And then yeah. I was thinking about all the ways that literature influences your work from like Chino Achebe, thinking about yeah. what it means to have a written story. Yeah. And yeah. even to think about Baldwin finding ways to tell his stories in English. Yeah. Um, so I'm really curious. I want to like think more about the oral influences in your work, yeah. these like many languages, accents, and the way that stories have been important in the way um, you read and uh, fiction has been important in your work or just let's talk about dance it feels important to talk about dance with your work yeah I think those are both two really important strands and um, the dance one being what I was bearing witness to when I was in Senegal we mm. um, went to a lot of kind of there was a township that had won a soccer tournament 
so they were celebrating winning the soccer tournament by doing like an evening festival of dancing and it was like two hours long all the kids were out there dancing and there were drums and it was this really fantastic communal thing that seemed remarkably actually just mundane and like quotidian like there's nothing special about it so there was the kind of ordinariness of it that I was like oh okay because this is one of the most kind of impactful things I've seen but this isn't this is not you know so this idea of this elevation but also this kind of respect of not trying to hyper sensationalize and understanding that there's a universalness to this experience across the continent right so just thinking about yeah how I was able to communicate and engage with that experience not knowing much about anything you know I can speak a bit of French but they're mostly speaking Wolof anyway so you know feeling both in and out of that experience but being able to communicate with the body um and trusting that I can communicate with my body right and sort of understanding that that's a reliable means of language so that really helped the paintings essentially it made the characters more elastic it made them more fluid I don't quite know where we went from dancing to diving that one will still come in time <laughs> that that one is that that one's more happening at the moment so I can't speak to it as much but certainly this rebounding kind of fluid bouncing um within the picture frame started in Senegal and has the versatility of it has been aided by the way that I feel as I'm moving around constantly through all these different spaces and um meeting people and engaging and and yeah just feeling my body shift feeling my body change um even as I make the work right because the, the painting can be quite a physically engaging activity and I do dance around in the studio too sometimes so it's very active it's very active I'm you know, like the canvas looks active and it certainly is made in an active environment in the studio so yeah, I want that to kind of be an inviting, an inviting concept, um, which is why that new museum grief and grievance exhibition is was those three artists are important because yeah, that physical performance was something that I hadn't really considered alongside the painting before, and yeah. sort of creating that activity and actually seeing then a physical body move in relation to this, you know, mm -hmm. um, or in relation to a silhouetted figure kind of gracefully moving through a, a figure playing space um yeah and then in terms of the literature um or actually, everything I think yeah. what I'm sorry to interrupt you I think what I'm trying to think about is like I feel like there's something deeply anti-colonial in the way you think about painting because right. it's not it doesn't commit to understanding the history of painting only through uh like oil on canvas or even when you comes to oil on canvas it is thinking about all the historical references that we've been discussing yeah. and in that yeah. way it makes me think about that older generation of anti-colonial right yeah. yeah yeah I think yeah moving to America helped with that a lot definitely mm. it helped me self-reflect and be more self-aware of what I was representing and you know as an ambassador of the United Kingdom when I'm traveling to America suddenly it becomes clear of of what I'm standing for and what you know it's it's simplistic when we think about just paint strokes but it it was an easy way for me to consider like the broader areas in which um I was then needing to be critical of a colonial way of being coming from the UK right so um yeah it started with that and once I was aware it became very clear that I wasn't the only one right so that that was fun to sort of like find other artists who've been through similar processes like I think Frank Bowling is a, my favorite example um, of artists who, yeah, Black British came to America, kind of started to understand a few things, bounced between both spaces, and then everything started to expand a bit more, mm. particularly through a kind of critical social dialogue and engagement, both in and around the work. Um, and, you know, I haven't done a lot of writing yet. I think it might happen at some point. It would be nice to, to get into some of that. But at the moment, yeah, certainly absorbing a lot of, of things that are helping me use oil paint more critically um, and self-reflectively, yeah. And it's interesting, especially looking at this detail, there's something about the quality of the lines uh, in your paintings that like, I can sense that what you call like kind of the dance or the movement of your body mm -hmm. in the, like they're so present. So the other thing I wanted to discuss, which for me is a big part of this work and feels important, and you mentioned this before, and it's like kind of how the bodies relate to gender or move mm. beyond the binary, the way we think about it. 
mm. especially uh, in English. And that to me felt related to these questions of like what it means to think about many oral languages. I, mm. My other language, Farsi is not gendered. So it's like, that's something mm. that I think a lot about. Um, mm. But you sometimes talk about how it is important for you to think about these bodies that are not necessarily reduced to their um, sex and like mm -hmm. genitalia. And instead yeah. there is senses of femininity in the way that like the curves can or their softness can be read. And there's a mm -hmm. sense of like their muscles feel important. And it's interesting for me, whether we gender that or not. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to hear more about how kind of what it means to explore these bodies that can be both different genders, but also kind of twins or mirrors of one another too, or how that shifts now that you're working with three, four bodies. Yeah, I think, I think definitely musculature, yeah, musculature, certain, there are certain signs that, that I'm leaving in there. So, but also they could be ambiguous, like certain pectoral spaces could look like they're either male or female, I suppose. But there is, I enjoy the kind of interplay that can happen there when you allow, when you, yeah, when you show muscles, but it's kind of, there's, there's certainly a softness to them. There's a firmness to them. The characters are strong, but it's not about the specific sex because yeah, when I moved to America too, I understood that a lot of painting particularly black figurative painting whether self elective or otherwise was often very characterized by uh frankly yeah just if there's not a dick it's not a man right in painting and i was mm -hmm. i always found that quite interesting because it just felt quite it felt like there could be so much more to that um and i mean that's certainly something that the silhouette helps with right absolutely is that kind of obscuring but it's certainly, I'm glad you use reduced because to me it seemed very reductive um, when there were certain conversations that just seemed like, well, if there's no penis, then how could this possibly be a black male figure? Because I mean, there's an extensive history of how of that relationship in America, right? Specifically that relationship to the black male and the sex. So it kind of didn't really seem like a conversation that A, I was fully equipped or ready to have at the time. And then also not as interested in, and I'm still not as interested in it, in terms of like with the images I want to create, I think that that's a different thing. And, you know, there are also plenty of artists who can really kind of get to the meat and bones of that in a kind of different way. I think, yeah, there are certain people, I think Kara Walker deals with that very well, for example, but there are certain nuances and subtleties when you're dealing with being very clear about black womanhood and manhood in painting that's like in America that, yeah, becomes very charged and, um, and yeah, I, I just want to be respectful of that, mindful of that within, and then also in relation to myself too, because, because these are bodies. And like you said earlier, you were counting them. Yeah. You know, I'm very conscious of putting all of these bodies out in the world all the time. Like there's a responsibility to that. Right. So, um, yeah, I'm just trying to be conscious and careful of what, what that means, yeah. um, of representing bodies and, and not needing representing bodies that are getting actively consumed and sort of like understanding how to navigate that consumption um as well right yeah 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 it's like i'm so happy that's like that word of like care is is uh something you brought up and i feel like there are um so deeply respected and cared for in your painting and for me it's been interesting to also like find their eyes and the way it like mm. kind of is, engages or like kind of is self-satisfied in many ways that makes me think about Carrie James Marshall's mm. commitment to his practice of painting mm. um it's also been interesting for me to think about um there's this beautiful catalog um of your work and your gallery helped me with the essays and the interviews and I really recommend to everyone to look into it hopefully one day I'll find it um physically uh but there's a essay on your work by Camille Okio mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thinks about the kind of the spiritual references whether it's like Christian or beyond and kind of in the end thinks about a figure like Octavia Butler or the yeah, sense yeah, yeah. of future fiction in your work and yeah. for me that's such a 
fruitful space for us to consider. So I wanted to give that a moment. Um, yeah, as thank a you way for bringing that up. Good. No, no, sorry. I just, I hadn't, no, no. It's, it's nice that it, cause I hadn't considered that, but it's also, so it's in here. Yeah. It's in here definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel like that's such a vast open space where it's like, what are their very real and very fictional possibilities of these bodies uh, in the, in the architecture, in the spaces, in the foliage. Um, so I wanna make sure I give time to other, to our viewers to ask questions. So this is kind of my last one. Uh, I know there's something that is like really deep in your work is the sense of color. And I really appreciate how often you kind of talk about how that is more intuitive, that it's not kind of a up here, uh, one by one decision, you kind of talk about mm -hmm. the influences of the different, like from Mexico to Senegal, how those palettes influence you. But I found this interview where you were talking about the bodies. It was also, you were talking about the sense of grief that is in the air with the kind of years we went by. I just wanted to read this quote where you talked about the why and what of the bodies in your paintings that I found so beautiful. Um, so when you, you were asked why you uh, have the bodies in your paintings, you say, I do it because I like their presence and the support that offers in other ways. Me bringing all these bodies out here and presenting them, then kind of crowding myself in the studio with them. It's like they're force fields, protective bodies. This is how they function for me. So I'm thinking about that mutualness of the care. Um, so that's my way of like, asking you about yeah. those parts that are not as much in language or much that yeah. sort of lose in art academic discussions. Yeah, I'm really grateful for that. I think specifically the point about grief, I think, so I'm gonna do another panel at some point later this year and I'm gonna be clear to bring that up because I think that also the immense loss that everyone's been going through whether directly or otherwise we've been feeling has just been such a, yeah, it's almost too much for us to really kind of put word to, but it's certainly not too much to kind of express in other means, right? So I think that, um, yeah, you know, I lost my dad a few years ago. It was, wasn't was wasn't good circumstances at all. And I immediately went into working and it wasn't so much that that's what I thought would help, but it certainly helped me develop a certain language and relationship to expressing color and thinking about how color can function um, emotionally, um, and yeah, like you said, supportively and yeah, narratively within that. Um, then thinking about how that connects to every other modernist painter through history, you know, specifically through the 20th century and before, you'll just find a lot of them saying like, yeah, this was a period of immense depression, so I used this color. This was a period of this, so I used that color. And it felt very kind of tangible and real for me in that moment. Um, and I know the same as of, I know it's the same for several other artists, people, whoever, anyone who's just kind of been going through a drastic shift like that over the past few years. So thinking about joy and expression through color um, and how sort of simplistic it actually is at that point, it's really kind of simplistic and straightforward. Um, and it doesn't need to be any more complex. Perhaps you could say that I've transitioned, I'm trying to transition a bit out of the very specific dark purple and violets that I was using for a few years, just to kind of show a bit of breadth. Um, so yeah, to, to my experience, to my sort of emotional landscape as well as anything else. Um, and when you see like, a, yeah, when you see one of my really deep violet blue paintings, it's like, okay, can I make a really deep, yellow gold painting right or like can I can I push a color to have that same kind of because blue is so easy to get melancholy and emotive you know it's a cheat code use blue and you'll just feel something so yeah how can you engineer a yellow to do that right how can you engineer a kind of beige or kind of this um pale violet that was in those two big ones in that room this kind of yeah almost neutral palette and then just really really push it so that it resonates with that same kind of emotional frequency that kind yeah that can that can bring something up that can be a nice uh a nice reflection you know and a nice nice representation of, of something yeah Tinji I'm, I must say I'm just like um I'm, I'm grateful there's a way that you kind of talk about 
uh, kind of how grief and joy can be woven and how these feelings can also have nuances and to see, um, I think for me was really present uh, seeing the exhibition to think about the care, um, the mutual care, this kind of many sided uh, sense of care that comes uh, with the bodies and the spaces mm. you create in your paintings. Thank you so much. I'm going to step back. People have questions. I don't want to take all your time. So thank you. Thank you uh, so much to, to you both. Um, it's been incredible. Um, uh, let's see, I'm, we'll go to Lynn um, Crawford first. You should be able to unmute. Hi, thank you so much. This is uh, amazing. Could you talk a little about your use of, of eyes? I kept thinking, I kept seeing them and in my head, I thought it was possibly a play on the organ I and the I, identity I and and the more I thought about it, the more I I saw those two things sort of playing against each other. This sort of looking while at the same time the the look at there's like this powerful sort of gaze, but then this idea of what that what it is that's looking or who it is that looking and it just seemed like such a a dance. Um, mm. And I was really taken with that. So anyway. Could you talk a little about that, please? <laughs> yeah, thank you for bringing that up. The eyes are the most fun for me. So that's the most fun I have making any of this work. <laughs> they're, the last, they're the last things I do. So I'll do the entire painting and then oh. it's, it's finished. As, as far as I'm concerned, it's finished when I put those little eyes in. So it kind of, it kind of carries a punctuation mark on the whole thing. Um, and I think about it the same way that you're describing. I'm not really sure whether I'm trying to say that this is me or like it's an authorship thing of me putting my little it's a kind of signature or something or whether I'm trying to say that the image is now this autonomous these characters are now alive and they're looking at me in this different way because I've waited so long to give um yeah to give them this kind of identity and I think that 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 dance is exactly what um I enjoy maneuvering in the studio that's that's really some of the most fun I have because they're different and there's a lot of repetition in my work, but I can't draw the eyes exactly the same. So they were always look different. It's always a bit, you know, something's always a bit off in a way that means that the, the character actually ends up, or the, the expression ends up being kind of a completely different character every time, given maybe there's like a pinch in the iris in one way versus another way. Mm. And I think if I was perhaps, um, if I was printing, that would be a bit different. I would maybe have to hand finish it because, yeah, with the printmaking, they do come out a bit more unilateral and, and even. But I do like with the painting that it, they're different every single time. I can't control it. And they end up being uh, unique little personalities that are just like a flourish at the end every single time. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Thanks so much, Lynn. Um... Thank you for your answer. Uh, we're going to go to our friend GE next for a question. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Thank you all. Um, I guess, Tanji, I'm, I'm wondering, is your work a kind of anentheodromia, a uh, kind of process by which you seek out and embrace opposing quality from within internalizing it in a way that results in you know, individual wholeness, a way of incorporating opposing archetypes into the psyche to get it sort of a state of internal completion? Um, I'm going to look up the definition of that word. <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, I, it's basically, again, I was kind of defining it too. It's the process by which yeah. you're basically seeking out embracing the, the opposing qualities from within externalizing them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if I if I want, but in other words, kind of like uh, it's very Jungian in the sense of like shadow work and things like that. Yeah, I think so. I think so, and I think that at every point, my interpretation of that process shifts with within these shows and these bodies of work. And this particular one is is quite yeah, this is quite an elaborate and realized version of of that. I think because now I'm able to pull from like we we're discussing earlier a lot of these experiences and these very specific cultural kind of moments I can pinpoint now. So there are specific things I can play against each other now. And I think that that will only, you know, hopefully grow and increase. So I, I think that 
if yeah if there's a process at play or like a yeah an internal motion at, at play that would that sounds about right yeah or at least i do want them to seem like there's something at play right so whether maybe there's an entirely different process that it reads but i do want the paintings to read as if yeah there are things happening that are playing again like with for or against each other right internally and that i'm ultimately to show that i'm thinking um because that's my favorite kind of painting that, that shows that the person's thinking but like yeah i i like that i like that point it, it feels appropriate thank you very much enjoy the light of venice yeah thank you <laughs> i'm excited <laughs> yeah Thank you, G. Um, uh, let's see, we have a question I'm going to read on the behalf of um, Kevin, I believe, um, who asks, how, how, is your printmaking, how has your printmaking evolved since the aqua tint etching astral reflections? Um, yeah, that was, I, that was when I did last summer. I really enjoyed it. So there's more depth. There's, there's just a lot more depth to the prints. And I think if I was to come back, that was a six plate aqua tint, I'd probably do a few more and I would know how to kind of render the space a bit deeper. Um, the lithographs that were in the show that we showed through the slides earlier, there's quite, there's a, I've just, I pushed through to quite, to a point that I hadn't quite met with the um, aqua tint last year. But that's because that was my first kind of foray into really thinking about printmaking again after taking a few years off and primarily making monotypes. So yeah, I've I've been developing a lot of depth, I think. I think I really appreciate the the litho lithography process. And um yeah, I'll come back to etching as well. But I see both processes as, as an opportunity for me to add depth to my otherwise quite flat picture planes and kind of the the yeah the visual illusion and kind of play that comes with that um and yeah that's what that's what i love about printmaking well thank you thank you um i'm gonna turn it over to uh chloe stagman our programs director for questions hi Tunji. thank you so much for for this conversation which was incredibly generous and i had a chance to see the show and it's so beautiful um mm -hmm lovely hearing you speak to it. My question is about audience. You know, in the press release for this show, you really talk about how the works invite the viewer in. And I think Lynn's question was also on my mind. You know, I feel the gaze really does that in one way, uh, almost immediately when you look at them and you find the gaze each time. But I wonder if you can speak to how you as a painter and a printmaker think about audience as you navigate each show in different places and cultures that are relevant to you? It's a really good question. Um, it's, it's a good question because I think that I'm happy to be at a point where I can consider the audience right in that way. Um, Perhaps a few years ago, I was more just worried about being able to make the painting or realize the idea or something. And so, yeah, I, I think culturally, I did show some paintings in Senegal earlier this year, and that was my first time exhibiting paintings on the continent. That was quite a big deal. That felt very significant for me. Um, I'll do the same when I go back to Lagos next year. Those kinds of engagements make a big difference I think um in terms of yeah the audience and the spaces in which my work gets seen and received um because I guess it's just a an extension of myself and me and like how I'm seen and received in whatever spaces I'm in and um that's something that I really want to expand on definitely I think the work can attach onto things so I went I, I had a show in Paris and I went to the Musée L'Orangerie and I saw the water lilies and the Monet water lilies and that, so to sort of be in a context where my paintings were on show in this kind of environment, I think had quite a profound effect on what I'm doing now in a way, in a sense, considering that. And certainly the work I make in New York is heavily informed by trips I take to the Met and MoMA and stuff. So I think the expanding on places that I can go to and be at will help the paintings be 
yeah, more broadly, be able to communicate more, I think, when they travel to different places as well. That's the idea. Um, and that's kind of the hope. Um, yeah, it's a cool question because I'm thinking about it often, like ways in which I can localize um, the work um, and that, that process. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Tenji, for answering all these questions. Um, thank you all for your amazing questions. Um, thanks for this talk. We have a wonderful tradition here at the rail of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today I am so thrilled to welcome our poet laureate of the day, Imani Elizabeth Jackson uh, to the stage. Imani Elizabeth Jackson is a poet working across disciplines with particular attention to black ecologies, histories and intertextual practices. She is the author of the chapbook Salt Sitting reissued by Gloss and the book Flag, which is forthcoming from Future Poem Press and her writings appear in Apogee, Bomb, Poetry, Tri-Quarterly and elsewhere. Imani collaborates with Shandi Henry Smith as mouthfeel. Together, they engage black diasporic histories and culinary traditions through cooking, writing and ephemeral practices. Thank you, Imani, so much for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, thank you, Tunji and Yasi, for that really wonderful talk. Um, it's been really great to get to know more about your practice, Tunji. And um, that last question that you asked, Yasi, was like the question that was on my mind. So um, I'm glad that you asked it much more eloquently than I would have. Um, I, over the past few years, have been thinking a lot with um, the word hydrography, and then relatedly thinking about um, the word sound, especially as the body of water sound and um, the act of measuring that type of body of water or any body of water. So I'm just gonna read a few short poems related to those thoughts. This first one is doesn't have a title, The amount of sunlight landing here, the rate of water rushing per second, the flow of energy through a surface, these are flux, dysentery, the flux, lost fluids, an act of passing in and out, such as two crowds of people passing each other in a terminal. It can be painful. Once I saw her in passing and she smiled, it was all we could do. There's no such touch in passing, I don't think. When she'd gone, I'd fall into the floor and thought supposedly flux is a substance for soldering metals and vitrifying ceramics and glass. Or perhaps I thought it meant continuous change. Cataracts get their names from waterfalls. Opacity rains osmotic, osmotic rocks. It can be painful. It can be life on its way out. It can be. There are many forceful discharges that rely on downward motion. This next one is called, and then went to swim there. And it's um, sort of a broken contrapuntal. So you can read it either way, um, either across or down or both. Um, and just, you can see, kind of is long and skinny in columns on the page. And I'll read it both ways. I did this, the line dropped and drowned, and then I went and dredged it up, inching up its weighted end by hand, my hands working properly, making use of the strength of my back for inquiry's purpose. The weather set conditions for all sounds, I cannot be made to fathom without consistent marking, and thus went the line probing the dark stretch below a straight unclear. Surveillance helps one know what is possible to be known at. Conditions for all sounds, the weather set. To see the line dropping gave me such pleasure. I went and dredged up the thing 
counting where it had gone to the bottom leagues below of noise, my back, an extension or of my hand, sounds, the weather set conditions for all. I did this. I could not be made to see the line, to fathom the line, dropped without dropping and drowned. Consistent marking gave me, and then, and thus, such pleasure. I went, went the line, I went and dredged probing and dredged it up, inching the dark stretch up the thing, up its below, counting, weighted end, a straight where it had gone, by hand, my hands, unclear to the bottom, working properly, leagues below, making use of surveillance. The strength helps one know of noise, of my back, what is possible, my back, for inquiries to be an extension or purpose known, eh? Of my hand. The weather set conditions for all sounds, conditions for all sounds, the weather set, sounds, the weather set conditions for all. And then I'll just read one more, one or two more, which are both sort of like ocean floors and they sit really low on the page, at the bottom of the page. Cast the flower out to sea. It's over. I'm blown. It is known how ooze tucked the floor away, up on the shoulder. Once upon a time, the shield of said sully, how to say what it seemed that I suckled the bone. I tow along in constant readjustment. To tow, I tread and plead in favor of a drape of order to measure and write the compact fold. It drags to rope along into consistency. Friends find their anchor points, latch on to rock or stable leaf braced for the push of the current. Time has yielded to the tasks of salt, degradation ad infinitum. The floor is a field now. There are curios and detritus, cast away sea floor to hit against. Wow, thank you so very much, Imani. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, again, Tunji and Yasi for this conversation. Um, we'd like to thank everyone at uh, Nikhil uh, Bouchain for helping to make today's event possible. We'd also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible. You can view today's event and our full um, archive on the Rails YouTube channel. For the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events like our daily NFC. Please check the chat for a link to donate. Um, and so uh, join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a poetry reading curated by Nikki Walschlager, featuring Nikki Walschlager, Ronald Davis, and Lucas DeLima. And you can now turn on your microphone and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, Imani. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. That was incredible. Imani, your poems were unreal. That was beautiful. Thank you. Thank the you. poems are amazing. The poems are so good. Amazing work. Thank you, Kenji. Thank you, Yasi. Joining from afar. Bye, everyone. Bye, all. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye.